Live from our studios at Coco Mimli, this is Joy News Prime with me, NS Mino, coming up in our headlines. Some employees set to benefit from the new income tax rate will find out if you qualify and how. Also, 13 dead, 20 injured in a car crash at Anriaso Tunnel in the Bibieni Anriaso Bekwa municipality of the Western North Region. According to the information, 13 people have lost their life and 19 people are still on admission. They have sustained serious injuries. While well, led police to deal ruthlessly with persons involved in child labor, that's Coco Ball's strong warning as its intelligence and police bust eight farmers cited in the journey's latest hotline documentary, Children in Coco Labor. Ghana Coco Board do not subscribe to any acts of child labor within the cocoa industry, and wherever we find it, we shall ensure that uh, we deal with it. In business, the Association of Ghana Industries rejects claims by Guta. The reversal of the benchmark discount will result in a 25% increase in the prices of goods. We'll hear from the association after President Tekufuado suspended the policy. We do not take actions. Yes, it will have an effect. But that is why uh, the management of uh, CMC and Cocoa Board have not rested since the issue came. We've engaged them. We are taking other proactive means of making sure that, yes, we get the cocoa ship. We are live on DSTV, channel 421, Go TV 144. Thanks for choosing us. This is your home of independent, fearless and credible journalism. I'm Ernest Mina. Thanks for joining us. The details now. Now, this may be good news for some of you, depending on how much you earn. There's been a review of the income tax rate. Some of you may begin to see marginal increase in your salary. That's not because your employer is generous. It's as a result of the review. So how much can you expect? Let's get some education on this. We are joined by an assistant commissioner at the Commissioner General's Office, Dominic Knapp. Thank you very much, sir, for joining us here on Join News Prime. What are the rates and how does it apply? Thank you very much and good evening to your listeners. Every year through the budget statement, government makes uh, some key and critical tax policy interventions to achieve a certain set objective. Uh, uh, the issue at stake here has to do with the individual tax rates. One of the interventions, as far as uh, the uh, policy intervention has to do with uh, the individual tax base, which is supposed to provide safety net for the low income, you know, NS. Okay. Now, what it is is that uh, if you earn 4,380 per annum, the law says that don't pay tax at all. 4,380 Ghana, you are not paying any tax. If we convert this one into rent, that means that your, if you earn 365, Ghana cities per month, you don't pay any tax at all. Okay. If you add, yeah, additional income of 1,320, you pay tax a rate of 5%, which works up to 66. Now, what it means is that if your total income for the year is 5,700, you are paying only 66. That is the first 4,380, you don't pay tax on it at all. Then the additional 1,320, you pay tax at a rate of 5%, which is 66. Now, what does it mean? What it means clearly is that uh, there is going to be a marginal tax rate, marginal uh, uh, what's it mean? relief, as it were, for uh, self-employed persons and salaried you know, workers. Mm. If you are a salaried worker, obviously, you are going to experience an, uh, a reduction in your tax payment. This is just because government has reviewed upwards a individual tax base to provide some cushion to set some individuals. But let me just say, hasten to say that if you are you are high income earner, of course you may also experience a little drop in your taxes. It's just going to be a little, not so much. Mm. Whatever it does, there is an increase. Okay. In disposable income. So just for clarity, this is mainly going to benefit low-income earners. So if you earn so much, like my producer, Abla de Souza, 
uh, it means that this may not apply to you. Oh, obviously, every person will experience uh, marginal income. But those who are going to actually experience so much are the low income earners. Great. So your producer certainly will experience some little. So, very little. Increase. Okay. Now, th does this place any responsibility on the employer or employers? The responsibility it places is that the employer is required to actually uh, deduct the appropriate you know, taxes to the Ghana Revenue Authority. So it may require to, uh, the employer to configure their system to ensure that they accommodate the new rates as provided mm -hmm. by law. Uh, Mr. Nab, when does this take effect? Uh, it was uh, gazetted and assented on the 31st of uh, December 2021. What it means is that effectively from January 1, it has taken effect. But let me also say that it is only for resident uh, individuals. If you are in a resident individual, you cannot actually take part in this. Your tax rate will be 25% if you are a non-resident individual. So this yes. is actually meant for resident individuals. Great. Uh, are there anticipated challenges uh, and that the GRA is seeing that this may bring in, how should affected persons go about it? Uh, what it means for the GRA is that there will be uh, a little drop in the PAYE taxes that GRA will collect. Uh, the challenge for GRA would mean that we have to go all out to ensure that others who are not uh, in the tax net are actually uh, uh, brought in. Otherwise, I don't foresee any. Mr. Nab, I'm grateful for your time. That's an assistant commissioner at the office of the Commissioner General at the Ghana Revenue Authority. Now, away from that, we will let police to deal ruthlessly with persons involved in child labor on cocoa farms. That's the warning from the Ghana Cocoa Board following the Joy News' latest hotline documentary highlighting how children are rented for as little as 800 Ghana cities to work on cocoa farms in part of the country. The documentary titled Children in Cocoa Labor reveals how traffickers rent out children, including 10-year-olds, to cocoa farmers for as little as 800 Ghana cities for a full year, weeding and carrying cocoa beans. Here's an excerpt of the documentary. One trafficker who is responsible for the presence of many of these children in Eluokrum is Musa Kwabena. He says he entices the parents of these children to gain custody of them with the promise of exciting returns. The woman my money by the year hundred and all of us by hundred in year. Oh, okay. No, no, cry himself. What did he say? He has a network of traffickers in the northern part of Ghana, specifically Chiripone. They help him identify families with vulnerable children. And he had been pursued, Okay. Who pursued ya? Who brought us in? The only police on us. I'm not back on the Okay. I don't know if you know what I'm saying. I don't know if you know what I'm saying. I don't know if you know what I'm saying. I do Okay. Okay. He told the investigative team he would charge 5,000 Ghana cities to traffic at least 10 children for us. Our cover story was that we needed children to work on cocoa farms urgently. He revealed one of the approaches he adopts to outwards the security officers is to forge the national identity of these children. In the 5,000, I just say, I'm going to do something, I'll be to me, the other. Okay, I'm going to say, yeah, look, say, I'm going to say, yeah, yeah, I'm going to say, 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 these costs increase the number of years these children spent working on cocoa farms at Eluokrum. Rashida was trafficked from Trepone by Musa. She was in class 6 at a basic school 
in Cherepone. Head of Public Relations at Cocoa Board says a joint team of police and Cocoa Board intelligence officials have arrested eight farmers at an operation aimed at bringing all those involved to book. As was indicated at the press conference, Ghana Cocoa Board do not subscribe to any act of child labor within the cocoa industry. And wherever we find it, we shall ensure that uh, we deal with it. So upon seeing the documentary, we have reported the matter to the police who have arrested and invited the people and currently taking them to the process. Uh, with the identified children, our officers are also in touch. The process will help us in identifying and also understand and appreciate their situation better. And then based on that, through the collaboration with other government agencies, get them, if it's a case that uh, they've been moved from somewhere else, get them re reunited with their family. The issue about child labor is not exclusive within the cocoa industry. And of course, the Ministry of Labor, uh, together with its, its agencies, are working on that. So identifying that there's something like that, uh, it is something we'll collaborate with the relevant agencies to ensure that the right thing is done. Cocoa Board, does, Cocoa Board plays the role within the cocoa industry, but there are some specific activities that are within the domain of some government, other government agencies. But we have a very strong synergy with this within us and based on that we'll leverage on it and get the issues resolved. So far, um, eight persons uh, per the information given, one in Western North and uh, seven in the Ashanti region who are helping the police with investigations. He adds that they consider the children working on cocoa farms serious and will ensure perpetrators of this illegal trade are brought to book. Cocoa Board takes very seriously any report which portrays a child of school going age as having engaged in activities on a cocoa farm that should be construed as child labor. We and the government have taken a strong stance against child labor of any kind and condemn any act which undermines effort aimed at, aimed at ensuring sustainability in the cocoa industry. Any case of child labor has, has, has a negative impact on the reputation of the country on the international stage. Fortunately, these incidents are not common practices in Ghana's cocoa industry. Ordinarily, one will not see farmers openly engaged in such practices when one visits our cocoa communities. And that is a testament of the fact that our sensitization efforts and interventions are yielding some results. That notwithstanding, the documentary shows that there are yet some criminal elements set on defying the government policy and undermining the serious effort of Cocoa Board to eradicate child labor in cocoa production. We have already reported the situation as on earth in the documentary to the police and some arrests have already been effected in Ashanti and Western North regions. All suspects and persons of interest are currently going through the legal process. We have similarly alerted the police on, we, we shall similarly alert the police on any other case related to child labor which comes to our attention for the persons involved to be apprehended and prosecuted. Let's do some other stories now. 13 people have been killed in a gory accident at Anyaso Tanoso in the Bibieni Anyaso Bekwai municipality of the Western North region when a Sprinter bus collided with a Metro mass transit bus. 19 others are currently battling for their lives at the Bibieni Government Hospital and the Anyaso Community Hospital with varying degrees of injuries. Uh, Adum TV's Augustin Bois, who has been on the beat, uh, joins me with some more from the Anyasu Community Hospital. Uh, Augustin, bring us up to speed on the uh, numbers of survivors, the number of survivors, survivors we have so far. 
Augustine, if you can hear me, uh, bring us up to speed on the numbers, the numbers that survived this gory accident. Yeah, Ernest, yes, I can hear you. Um, 30 people have been confirmed dead at um, uh, Anyasu Community Hospital and then Bibiani Government Hospital, where the accident victims were brought to. Currently, I'm at the Anyasu Community Hospital, where 25 accident victims were admitted. And then five died here, and eight people also died at uh, Bibiani Government Hospital. And as, as I'm speaking now, um, the medical superintendent has given us an assurance that the 18 people here, they are receiving treatment well, of which they believe that they can make it up. And we, we, we can see many people are here uh, to identify their relatives. As I speak now, but uh, the MTTD commander, ASP Emmanuel Osei, has told us that no um, body will be released to any family relative until further investigation is being conducted. Mm -hmm. uh, Augustine, how is the community reacting to this sad news? Well, what the residents told us was that uh, this is not the first time um, they are recording such accident, but uh, not who has to, to this extent. Um, they explained that uh, mostly accidents do happen at that same sub -care. but um, it is of, to the fact that uh, there's a minor injury that they sustain, but not to the extent that uh, 30 people uh, could, you know, lose their lives in such incident. Augustine, thank you very much uh, for bringing us up to speed on that uh, gory accident at BBSO uh, Ahuaso Tano in that municipality. Uh, let's go on to the other line and speak to uh, ASP Emmanuel Osei, uh, who is the MTTD commander uh, of the area. Uh, thank you very much, sir, for joining us. Well, he earlier gave us this interview narrating the cause of the incident. There was an accident today around 10 a.m. We had a report that a sprinter bus with registration number AS1819-19 involved an accident with Metro Mars bus with registration number AS7123Y. According to the source, the sprinter bus was coming from Sebi also to Kumasi direction. And the Metro Mass Bar was coming from Kumasi to the Rio so direction. So on reaching uh, Anyaso, the Sprinter bus was overtaking a vehicle in the cave. And in the process, he ran into the Metro Mass bus. And according to the information, 13 people have lost their life. And 19 people are still on admission. They have sustained serious injuries. And they are on admission. Let's speak to ASP live now. ASP Emmanuel Osei, he joins us with the very latest. Thank you very much, sir, for your time here on Join News Prime. What is the latest on your investigation with this accident? Yeah, the, thank you. The latest information is that uh, we've recorded a 13 days. Out of the 13, we have eight meals and then five females. And then they, those who have sustained serious injuries are 19. We have one at the BND Government Hospital, and then the rest of the 18 at Anyasu Community Hospital, as we speak. Mm. Uh, do we know if there will be any arrests in this incident, even though we know that the driver was involved in this and lost his life? Do we know if there's going to be any other arrests in this? Uh, okay, the driver of the Sprinter bus has lost his life, and that of the Metro Mouse bus. We are here to get him. Okay. Uh, efforts on way to get him to assist in the investigation. Mm. All right, thank you very much. So we'll leave it here for now. Uh, we'll bring you update on this as and when we do. But uh, a total of 2,924 lives were lost as a result of road accidents in 2021. This represents 12.9% increase in deaths when compared to 2020. So we'll bring you a breakdown of the figures as you see 
on your screen. So uh, this is uh, road traffic crashes, uh, comparative analysis of the year 2020 and 2021. So from uh, 2020, from January to December in 2021, you see the figure 15,972. But obviously in the year, the same period last year, there was a, a lower figure, which is 14,866. And so this represents uh, a, a marginal increase of 7.44. Uh, if you do the comparative analysis, 2020 and 2021. Now, if you look at uh, this person scaled within the same period. So we are doing the comparative analysis between 2020 and 2021. For 2020, the figure was 2,589. And for 2021, 2,924. So you see an increase there of almost 13% uh, just for persons killed between uh, you know, 2020 and 2021. So we have a total of 2,900. And 24. Now, and a comparative analysis of uh, the persons who were injured in the accident recorded. In 2020, we had 15,517, but it moved up to 15,680. When you do the uh, math, you see a marginal increase of 1%. But if you begin to go into the depths of the injuries, the degrees of the injuries recorded, there you'd appreciate how grave this is. Now, pedestrian knockdowns also constitute a huge part of the uh, crashes that are recorded uh, between 2020 and 2021. So in the year 2020, the figure is 2,728. And in the year 2021, 2,930. Obviously, an increase of 7.40%. This is just for pedestrian knockdowns. Now, we want to look at month-on-month -month distribution for 2021. So we started the year with 244 and ended with 316. Now, the 316 was recorded in the month of December. That should tell you a story, a story of an increase in road accidents during the festivities. Because if you look at April, for instance, you see... Uh, a slight increase also here, 263. But we also see something happening in February, uh, giving you 273. It's not so clear what accounted for this, but what we see here is that during the festive seasons, uh, there's a, a slight increase in the crashes uh, that we record. Also, the number of persons killed, the regional distribution. So Greater Accra has the highest number, and it's always been the case, if you look at it, it will take you back to the previous years, you see that the Greater Accra region has always recorded a good number of cases, that and the Ashanti region, and, and you see that on the screen. So the Greater Accra has 675, uh, the Eastern region 471, the Central region 211, the Western region uh, 122, and then the Ashanti region. So you see that the Greater Accra and the Ashanti region have the highest, with the lowest being the Northeast region, 18 uh, cases recorded uh, within the year under review, 2021. Now, let's also look at the road crashes, the deaths, and we are looking at a 10-year period between 2011 and 2021. So between 10 years, this is our record for road uh, crashes, the deaths recorded on our roads. 2011 gave us uh, 2,199. Uh, we went up slightly in 2012, but we dropped. The figure began to drop from 2013 all the way to 2016. But guess what happens? In the year 2017, we shoot up again to 2084. We drop uh, in the year 2017, and then it's been an upward trajectory uh, since then. So since 2017, the figures continue to rise, and now we stand at 2,924. That is not some good record there as far as the campaign is concerned. And we're going back further. So what I gave you earlier, this was for a 10-year period. This was for a 10-year period. This was for a 10-year period. Now, this one gives you from 1995 to the year 2021. 
and this is our record. I mean, there's, there's, there's been a trajectory, an upward trajectory of road crashes in the country. And obviously, we need to do something about this. Um, motorcycle crashes has been also quite significant. And you hear the MTTD always talk about the fact that motorcycles constitute about 43% of all the crashes we see on our roads. And so persons killed so far, 1,266 for the year 2021 alone. And on your screen there is the uh, record for number of injuries as well for the year um, 2021, January to December. And uh, we definitely need to keep ourselves safe on the road and observe all the regulations on our roads. Now, two weeks into the new year, there is no clarity on when school children in basic schools were returned to the classroom. And that is a claim of the deputy ranking member on Parliament's Education Committee, Dr. Clementa Park. The Bursa South MP contends that children in private schools already in school uh, will have an unfair advantage over their colleagues in public schools. Dr. Park is warning that if the situation is not resolved immediately, he will hold the Education Minister before Parliament, which is set to resume next week. If you are going to have a strong and robust educational system, you ought to pay a lot of attention to basic education. As we speak now, heads of basic schools in Ghana, public basic schools, teachers, don't know when basic schools, public basic schools, are going to reopen. The original communication that many had, particularly those who were seeking transfer to new schools, was that they should report before the 4th of this month to suggest that the schools should have opened on the 4th. That has not happened. As we speak today, private basic schools across the country have reopened, and yet we have no idea of exactly when public basic schools will reopen. This should be a cause for concern. And indeed, parents and teachers are worried about the fact that we don't seem to know when, and we don't seem to have a regular academic calendar, now also for the basic school system. As deputy ranking member, have you tried to find out what exactly may be the challenge why these schools are still not reopened? Well, I have not made contact with the minister and I have not made contact with the director general. But we shouldn't be asking them to do what they are being paid by the taxpayer to do. It is their responsibility to manage the educational sector of this country. We as members of parliament clearly have oversight. And what I am doing is part of my oversight responsibility. Mm. So I expect that government through the ministry or the Ghana Education Service, would come out and let the good people of this country know the reasons why public basic schools are yet to reopen. Okay. That is their responsibility. All if right. they don't, when Parliament resumes, clearly we will file questions and perhaps look at inviting the minister to the committee. Let's get some responses from the Education Ministry. Kwesi Kwaten speaks for uh, the ministry and he joins us. Thank you very much, Kwesi uh, Kwaten. Now, why are public schools at the basic level not reopened whilst their colleagues in uh, private schools are already in school? Uh, okay, thank you very much. I don't think the, the, the comparison is helpful because at the end, private schools are not competing with public schools. The most important thing is that students are able to get the instructional hours, get the necessary contact hours, and of course, are able to finish the syllabus or their curriculum. But so when course, will I mean, private, when will children in basic schools go to school? So you ask the question, let me, let me learn respectfully. So, I mean, like you, you, you rightfully put it, at the end of the day, we want to know when students are going to school. If you recall, we have to appreciate, of course, I mean, have a dispassionate conversation and then appreciate the issue. Then at least we'll be able to, I mean, answer your question about whether or not students are going to school, I mean, at, at which time they are going to school. Okay. Yes, as I speak with you, the Minister for Education has done something. And of course, that thing that he did, it obviously did not come from, from a vacuum. I mean, with regards to school reopening, students' academic calendar. Yes, we do admit at the ministry that for some time now, when it comes to, I mean, communications about clear timelines and academic calendar of students, yes, there have to be some discrepancies and inconsistencies in it in, in time past. I mean, it is a more reason why the Minister for Education, Donald Dr. has said that under his watch, we are not going to see this, and this is going to be the time of, or, I mean, a turn of the past. And so he's 
directed of apparently gone ahead to set up a committee of which that committee have been have been doing their work and their draft report is ready the work of the committee is to come out with a one-time calendar and that calendar is not only going to be for the 2021-22 academic year but of course beyond that 2022-2023 and even 2024 so what i can assure parents is that everybody should come down uh, within this week, we are very hopeful that the committee will come out with this report so that we address this challenge about the inconsistencies in our academic timetable once and for all. Uh, because, yes, I mean, that admission has already been made at the end by the ministry that, of course, I mean, even if you look at, for instance, Wyatt, for instance, the, 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 the students writing their exams, their calendar has changed. I mean, recently, students wrote uh, uh, BEC in November, which ought to have not been the case, has not been the norm. Uh, we are seeing university students, I mean, taking up the admissions in January, which in the past or in time past was September. So, yes, we do admit that post-COVID, most of our, our, our part of getting back to, to, to our normalcy, most of the academic calendar changed. And, of course, it brought some, some, some level of discrepancy and inconsistencies in our understanding, especially when we, we compare... The, the current timetable to what we witnessed in the past. Mm. And so what I can assure parents is that hopefully by the close of this week, the committee, which was chaired by uh, Reverend Intim Fodjo, the Deputy Minister uh, of Education, in charge of general education, has finished their work. And uh, we are very hopeful that within the week, they will come out to announce the date for reopening of this. And what is more interesting is that with this work, it wasn't only the ministry that did it. The committee consisted of members from TAS, uh, members from GES, representatives from MACA, and of course, I mean, some, 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 some parents and teacher, you know, mm -hmm. that all came together to draw this timetable once and for all. So, yes, we do admit the challenge, but we have been working on it, and we are very hopeful that by close of week, I mean, we will address that challenge. And of course, I mean, these whole uh, uh, discrepancies in the communication of, 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 of timetables. And of course, academic calendar will be a turn of the past. Mr. Quatin, what you have told us, which is clear, is that the committee's work will be available this week. The report will be available this week. When will the ministry take a decision as to when students will go to school? When can we expect that decision to be announced? I think I premise that on the work of the committee. And, and I am unable to prejudice the work of the committee. What is more important is that there was a committee that was put in place the committee has, has done with their draft reports. Uh, of course, our, our president leadership is also making their inputs. And, and the work of the committee was that extensive and, and collaborative Very with well. all stakeholders on board. Mm -hmm. And whatever decision that will be communicated will be the, 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 the position of the ministry, of course, from, from I mean, uh, relative to the work of the committee. So uh, I cannot say that uh, the ministry is going to take a different position, but the committee was instituted uh, by the ministry. Yes, Mr. Quatin, so the deputy ranking member on the Education Committee raises a number of issues, including the fact that 44,000 teachers left the teaching uh, profession in 2021 alone. I understand you are seeking some further uh, you know, official briefing on this, but is this something that you will look into? Uh, as of now, I, I, let me admit that I have not been able to confirm the figures. Of course, I mean, today I have made a lot of contacts with CS and I have not been able to confirm the figures. So I will respectfully decline a comment on that, at least, at least for today. So that subsequently, when I'm able to confirm the figures, and of course, I mean, look at uh, 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 probably the causes for, for that level of attrition, then we are able to probably take the conversation from there. Thank you very much. That's uh, Kwesi Kwati. He speaks for the Education Ministry. We have uh, joining us on Zoom the Executive Director of Africa Education Watch, Kofi Asari. Uh, he joins us on the phone. First, uh, what is your reaction to the delay? Uh, we've had the explanation from Kwesi Kwati, who speaks for the Ministry. But uh, how do you react to this when their counterparts in private schools are already in school? Um, good evening, and good evening to your cherished audience. Uh, three months ago or so, the minister assured us that um, he was putting together a committee to take over the determination of the calendar for the academic year. After we complained severally about the, you know, um, repetitive changes yeah. that um, it was was subjected to, 
And so, um, yes, we are told that the committee has actually made some proposals, uh, but they are consulting or you know, bouncing it past uh, the, head, the, the head teachers and other stakeholders at the school level for their acceptance. So, um, at least we now know that we are going to be having a timetable that is not uh, the timetable drawn by uh, people from inside the GNS contest and then MOE contest without consulting wide. And as the PRO said, this time there is wide consultation, which means that previously there was no wide consultation and that it was a limited timetable which was drawn by a few a few people, or one, one or two people without cognizance to other factors that may have uh, been omitted. So I think we have to wait uh, by the end of this week. I'm sure we should receive uh, feedback from the Ghana Education Service in respect of its academic year schedule through the information I have on the ground. Mm. Um, yes, it is a bit worrying. It is, it is a bit worrying because uh, private schools have reopened. Um, but if you look at the sequence of things, uh, common core, the junior high school uh, training in the junior high school curriculum, Training is scheduled for I think on the 14th or so. It looks as if that it looks as if senior junior high schools cannot go to school until that training has ended. Um, and um, you, we all know that the national standard test led to the postponement of the vacation by one week, which means teachers were forced to spend one one more week in school because of the NST. And um, I, we I, we expected, you know, that. That one week would be atoned, atoned for, you know, in this new year. So, hopefully, end of this week we get the new calendar. For me, the most important thing mm -hmm. is the test of character of the timetable that will be developed. It is not about whether a timetable will emerge or not. It will definitely emerge, but whether the timetable will stand uh, the entire academic year right. without being any and you have you have released an outlook for this year uh, in, as far as the education sector is concerned. We'll get into that shortly. But just before that, uh, we're learning from the deputy ranking that about 44,000 teachers left the teaching profession in the year 2021 alone. Uh, uh, that's according to Clement Park. Has this been on your radar? Oh, that is not according to Clement Park. It's actually according to the Ministry of Education. That is in the original um, data captured in the Education Management and Information Systems um, report released by the Ministry of Information as far back as December. Mm -hmm. We have raised that issue. It's about it's actually more than 40, it's about 45,000. About 15.4 percent of teachers left primary and junior high schools in in 2021 alone, and. Um, we, we raised the issue because we were alarmed, looking at a trend in teacher attrition. Average teacher attrition between 3 and 5 percent. We are seeing a 15 percent increase in teacher attrition, I mean 15 percent teacher attrition in one year. But there is a global phenomenon. I've been reading articles from the Forbes, from the from Forbes magazine and other uh, reputable websites where the issue of high attrition has been linked to the post-COVID school reopening process and all that. Um, and so I see a trend not only in Ghana, mm. but in other African countries, and especially in also in, uh, in 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 Eastern and Western Europe, we've seen some irregular movement of teachers from the classroom. But our situation is uh, is, is irregular because having seen the teacher attrition of more than ten percent in the past twenty years, and what we have on our hands is fifteen percent leaving the basic school system in just one year. And now to your outlook, what should we watch out for, very briefly? Well, I think we are still in the middle of our uh, reform. We should watch out for the rollout of the junior high school curriculum. And uh, we should watch out for the supply of textbooks to, to, uh, to support the proper, proper implementation of the primary school curriculum, which, which, which had a false start in the past two years. Um, we have heard the Ministry of Education to ensure that as it plans to roll out the junior school curriculum, it doesn't suffer two years without textbooks as the primary school suffered. And that it should do everything with this within its might power to make textbooks available for junior high schools within the first year of the curriculum implementation so that mm. uh, the lessons from the primary school um, process is actually learned, you know, moving forward. 
Mr. Asari, we are grateful for your time. That's the Executive Director of Africa Education Watch. This is Johnny News Prime with me, Anas Mino. Still to come in business, the Association of Ghana Industries reject claims by Guta. The reversal of the benchmark discount will result in a 25% increase in the prices of goods. We'll hear from the association after President Ekufuado suspended the policy. If we do not take actions, yes, it will have an effect. But that is why... Uh, the management of uh, CMC and Cocoa Board have not rested since the issue came. We've engaged them. We are taking other proactive means of making sure that, yes, we get the cocoa ship. Hello, good evening. It's time for business. I'm Charles Aite. The Association of Ghana Industries has fiercely rejected claims by the community of importers that a reversal of the 50 and 30 percent benchmark values on selected items and cars, respectively, will result in a 25 percent hike in prices of goods and services. President Sakufuada suspended implementation of the reversal policy for wider consultations after traders and importers highlighted the impact on consumers. The chief executive of the AGI, Sechuma Kwabwa, at a press engagement argued that such claims from Guta have no scientific basis. Here is his explanation. The benchmark value reversal is not an imposition of additional duty. It's not an imposition of an additional duty. The duties were there all these years, up until 2019, when Ghana alone decided, remember, that Ghana is part of ECOWAS. Within ECOWAS, we are what we call the seed, the common external tariffs. The common external tariff defines the various tariff regimes or levels for all products within West Africa. Government's strategy was that because we cannot touch the duty rates, if you want to reduce the cost of bringing goods into the country, let's touch the benchmark values. What the benchmark value means is that the values at which you apply the duty on, government decided that they will reduce it by half without touching the rates, the duty rates. So invariably, you reduce the value, the, the duty that you are paying without touching the rates. Do you understand? So it's not an imposition of a new duty. All we're saying is that go back to where you were before. So we'll be consistent with our colleagues in the sub region. It's as simple as that. Meanwhile, the newly elected president of the AGI, Humphrey Enyim Daka, says Ghana's industries are on the precipice of collapse and that only a strong and viable economic policy as a reversal of the benchmark value can help in placing industries back on a path to competitiveness. We all know between the SEFA and the CD, the SEFA is relatively stable than the CD. So they mount a pressure on the government and government gave in, but hindsight have taught us that that was the variable that made our prices then high today they know very well that with the reversal of this product they cannot go to togo and do same because now all the common external tariffs will be same and the variable will still be the exchange rate factor and therefore they need to fight tooth and nail and you can see in their posture their attitude and the vociferous action to which they attach with the passion to, to destroy our country. This is unacceptable. We have demonstrated to you why such imports are hurting us if we have capacity. We have demonstrated that we have capacity. Where we do not have capacity, we grow it. And capacity has a correlation with demand and consistent economic policy. So we have demand, we have capacity, if the policy distorts the consistency, all the investors will back up. Away from that, government has indicated that it will extend the suspension of the price recovery and stabilization levy on petroleum products for another month till the end of February. But what has influenced government's decision to press ahead with the program when the current one is yet to expire? It's been explained here by George Rafi in this report. Government's decision to extend this policy program is based on some initial work which shows that prices of crude oil could be going up again from next month. Therefore, this action is needed to try and cushion consumers of petroleum products locally. This will indeed help reduce the price that consumers pay at the pumps should the price of crude oil increase further on the international market at the end of this month. 
crude oil is currently trading at around $80 a barrel and there are projections that it could hit $90 a barrel from next month. President Akufado was at the end of December 31, 2021, asked to extend the freeze of price of the additional levy by another month ending January 2022. This is based on requests coming from the Energy and Finance Ministers here in Ghana. This was to help reduce the fuel prices by some 2%. This is because the suspension of the policy was expiring on December 31, 2021. That would have resulted in prices going up at the pumps by more than 4% per litre for diesel and petrol from January 1, 2022. The price stabilization levy charges 16 pesos on petrol and 14 pesos on diesel. However, freezing the application of these charges even from next month will mean that these levies would not be applied on fuel from February 2022. However, there are some who have raised concerns about the sustainability of this program based on the current projections that crude prices will still be going up going forward. That will be all for business. We have sports coming up next. Do stay. Hello, good evening, and welcome to the sports segment live here on the Joy News Prime with me, Rick Wampofo. The Black Stars got off to a disappointing start in the 2021 Africa Cup of Nations after losing to Morocco in their Group C opener on Monday evening. Impressive Sofiane Bufao got the only goal of the game in the 83rd minute. So that was the winning goal scored by Sofiane Bufao in terms of Group C action. Uh, Gabon are currently uh, facing uh, Kobarus and Gabon are leading that game by one goal to no. Coincidentally, Gabon is the team that Ghana would be playing in their next Group C game on January 14th. And ahead of the all-important game, our President Kufuado has been urging the four-time African champions to end their 40-year drought. Be of one mind and spirit and be united on or off the pitch. Whether you are in the starting 11 chosen by coach Milovan Rejevic or not, you owe it a duty to back and support wholeheartedly your teammates representing the nation on the field. That is how a fifth AFCON trophy for Mother Ghana can be achieved. To you, my fellow Ghanaians, now more than ever is the time to throw our unwavering support behind the team. Well, that's how we wrap up the sports segment here. You can get some more sports stories on my joy online for slash sports or follow us on social media for all the updates in the 2021 Africa Cup of Nations on Twitter. Uh, via at Joy Sports GH. My name is Aurelio Kwampo from the news continues right after this. Time now for showbiz and beautiful Becky is here with the very latest. Hello Becky. Hello to you. Good and to it's see you. Good to see you too. Let's talk about Majid Michelle because he's been trending. He was on uh, the reason is she says, says on Sunday. On Sunday mm -hmm. and the stories kept coming. So let's talk about uh, the movie industry because he has waded into the conversation about whether or not we have a movie industry. He says, no, we don't have a movie industry um, until we see studios and we see um, agencies that can, you know, sell mm -hmm. uh, their products. We're That's, not there yet. We're not there yet. You see, when you see an industry, then we have to see studios and we have to see distribution agencies. Hmm. That, okay. that is an industry. We, we, we've never had an industry. What we have is what we have are individuals that through their passion created films individually. You have the Abdul Salams, the mm -hmm. AA Productions, you know, the Gupado films. That at the time, these people were businessmen. These people were businessmen, individual businessmen mm. that had the interest for stories to tell stories. So they use their business money to pay us, to pay the crew, let's make a film. And the man wants his money back. So after the internet took over, he, he couldn't sell the CDs anymore. So, so he stopped. Why? Because he's a businessman. 
The man is not coming back. But just because of his passion for stories and film, they just continued. But where is the industry? It was the people that were the industry. These people were the industry. These in the Abdul Salam Mumuni was the industry. Where's the industry? Show me one studio where we can sit and, 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 and set up a living room and act. Show me a distribution company. So we don't have. Where is it? We've never had. We've never had. The, you see, the industry was a group of people that came together and made films. You know, we've heard this before, but there's yeah. something about the way he says it. Yeah, by the quite passionately. By the way, uh, Majid says that there's nothing wrong with his voice. So if, I mean, anyone is accent, I don't know who is accent, but if anyone is accent, he's saying that uh, there's nothing I, wrong with I the voice. I wish I heard him oh, say that well, I within can the context, because obviously we know that's not his, that's not the voice Yeah, really but saying. well, he, on the same platform, he, he mentioned that, I mean, there's absolutely nothing wrong with his voice and that he sounds like Michael Jackson, but that's just by the way. <laughs> I'm What's... sure he was scared. <laughs> I'm so sure about that. So uh, he's also been talking about the fact that his wife uh, is the reason why he is Majid Michelle. Mm -hmm. Reminds me of Denzel Washington saying okay. that Pauletta uh, Washington uh, is the reason why he is Denzel Washington. Something mm -hmm. like that. I, I won't be Majid Michelle if it wasn't for my wife. Wow. That's, that's a bold statement. Yeah. What, what does it mean, though? <laughs> she, 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 she's a center and the core of my support, you know. Men, men don't like um, coming home late at night to an angry wife. You know, I, I, I go on set, I come home very late, you know. I, I sometimes I leave before sometimes I'm not even at home at all because we are lodging in a hotel you know and men men you see people think or most women think if I sleep with him and I do the sex right I'll catch him hmm. men men don't stay because of sex you know if 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 they say if sex was what keeps every man all prostitutes would be, would be married by now Mm. And there will be no presumption because once you have, you, you, she, she gives you good sex, you get married to her. But it's not the sex that keeps us. It's, it's, it's that extra thing that makes a man stay at home. Mm. You know, and, and without my partner, I, I don't think I'll have the peace of mind if she couldn't take everything I was doing. I kiss people on screen. Is I that do, for real? I do explicit sex scenes on screen. And how do you think my wife takes that? You know, and that is why you see a lot of, you'll be surprised. Why you see a lot of marriages break up, even in Hollywood, when they can't stay together? Mm. Because Jolie can't see Brad Pitt to go to kiss another Jennifer Aniston on the screen. she said, what did you do with her? Why, what, what do you think happened? But you see, my wife, my wife is special. She's mm. absolutely special. I don't know how God just gave it to me. Because you, this is what you need. Take this one. I have paid her for you. If it wasn't my wife, I don't think I'd be Majid Michelle. Why did you meet that though? I'm just curious. Why did I what? Why did you meet your wife? Where? Yeah. At a school fanfare. What, in GSS? At St. Theresa's school fanfare. At what level of education? She was 15 years old. Oh boy. But Mary was 15 when she gave birth to Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> so when you saw her 15, how old were you then? 17. You knew she was going to be your wife? I, 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 I fell in love with her instantly. She didn't fall in love with me because I'm not physically attractive. Oh, says who? No, no, no. You should have seen me 15 years ago. Ah. You should have seen me 20 years ago. Go watch my old movies. Quite an interesting interview. Yeah. So yeah, I show yeah. what they say, eh? Behind every successful man is a woman. A woman. Okay. Do you have a woman, though? Thank you very much, Becky, for bringing that show, base. That's not all for show, base. That's I still not have all. You have so some more. I still have more stories. I was just asking okay, your okay, question. Okay, okay, okay. So what's the, what's the next story? What, you don't have a woman in your life? What's the next story, Becky? Oh, you're so cute. <laughs> <laughs> well, Chance the Rapper. Uh, okay. uh, is in town. Uh, he's right. been enjoying himself. He's been enjoying Ghana. Mm. Uh, he's been finding his roots. 
uh, trying, you know, different things here and there. And, and he, 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 he's enjoying Ghana and he, he loves uh, Kodier. Well, he's teasing out something. Okay. Um, it looks like um, something's coming up. Something is coming up because that's what they said. Back home, yeah, yeah, we knew it had to happen, yo. Something's coming. This will be um, very good for the industry, mm -hmm. you know. That we've had like a couple of them coming in, Chance yeah. the Rapper, Vic Mensa, um, you know, lots of you know, the we need the, these collaborations. They so, help well, us, I'm you know. definitely expecting uh, or looking forward to you know, something. Uh, between Sarkodie and Chance, hopefully uh, the movie industry will also follow suit, and we have you know more collaborations. More uh, that's that's what we need. Yeah, thank you, Becky. You Finally, been, I get to say you thank been, you. You haven't, you haven't been very comfortable, you. and you didn't make me feel comfortable because I just asked you whether you have a woman or not. But that's that, but that's that's a, it's an okay question to answer. So why didn't you? But answer I just don't want question? to answer. That's all. Because because. Thank you, Becky. That's it for sure. <laughs>Thanks for staying with us here on Join East Prime. Now, the University Teachers Association of Ghana, UTAG, is blaming its ongoing strike on the failure of the National Labour Commission to be critical and proactive in the delivery of its mandate. The university lecturers accused the NLC of bias in its arbitration of disputes between organized labor and government, members of UTAG were forced to call off a strike, a similar strike last year, on the condition that they will be uh, migrated onto the newly uh, agreed market premium approved by government in 2019. But after several failed attempts to get government to hold its side of the bargain, the lecturers have ditched the classroom indefinitely, pending when their concerns will be addressed. We'll hear from you, Tech, shortly, but first, listen to some of the students at the University of Ghana who fear the academic calendar may be thrown out of gear if the strike continues. Um, what we have learned is that um, a lot of the students are indeed gearing up, um, you know, for the academic year. Uh, but for a lot of the students that I've been speaking to um, off air, what they express is, you know, a general uh, and really widespread apprehension about the possibility of the academic calendar being derailed and thrown out of gear. So I'm just going to speak to um, a few of them to uh, find out how they are taking um, this news. We are not really happy about it <laughs> because our the COVID has brought some distractions and has um, put uh, yeah put a distractions uh, within our studies. Mm. So we are not really happy about. So we really want the lecturers to come around mm. this week or next week to start our mm. academics. Yeah. Well, so if they don't come this week or next week, as you are asking, then it means that um, your academic calendar is going to be thrown out of gear. Am I correct? Yes, I guess because during the pandemic, we, uh, we were given a short period uh, to study a lot of stuff. Mm. We wouldn't want that to happen again. Okay, so. okay. Well, no, this is very unfortunate news to us, a student, uh, as a final year student. We are not expecting. We weren't expecting something like this to happen at this particular point in time because. As I, as I speak to you, I'm currently uh, embarking on my project. I've started the first part. And as we speak, because of this strike, when I speak to my supervisors, they say they are on strike officially today. So, But tonight, Utah is blaming the inactivity of the NLC for the current situation. Dr. Samuel Nkumban is president of the University of Ghana chapter of Utah. If you will remember, the last year we were very categorical about the fact that you do not uh, refuse to respond to us. And then when we take the action, then you say that it is. I mean, they asked, he was asked on your platform categorically as to whether or not our industrial action was illegal. He said he couldn't say so because we had given due notice. So if due notice is given and you have not taken action, and then the industrial action is called, why would you blame the labor union for taking the action? And so that is, that is the challenge. And so they need to be more proactive in terms of when uh, notices are given, then you can engage the people. The, 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 it's a public institution serving uh, us. And from 20th December until today, our understanding is that they were on vacation. And I thought that as all public sector institutions are supposed to operate on the basis of which are public holidays as declared by the Ministry of Interior. 
And so that time lapsed between 20th December and 10th January. Something possibly could have been done, I suppose. And so for me, uh, I think that uh, our public sector institutions need to be more uh, critical in delivering the services for which they take our money. Uh, of course, the taxpayers' money that we all draw from, and so they have to be critical, they have to be uh, meticulous in dealing with what they have a mandate yeah, to deliver. The National Labor Commission. You say the National Labor Commission's work, not being critical and meticulous with this work. I mean, for sure, I'm just thinking generally that if they were in the first instance where we had to go on strike and they were asked whether or not they had due notice, and they did, without taking action, if you, that is the reason for, that is your mandate, and you don't do it, are there any sanctions for that? Those are the questions we, are, we keep asking because we, we expect some proactiveness in dealing with some of these matters. So that if we have an issue, you have, we have notified you that this is the reason for which we want to go on an industrial action. And there is no engagement until that happens. Then <laughs> how could we say you are, you are serious? And that is why we find ourselves probably where we are. And it is not only UTAG. Many other institutions, they, I mean, the indication they've gone to court several times with other unions, not only UTAG. And, and that doesn't uh, augur well. And I, I, I think that they need to uh, rethink the way they are operating and how they are handling issues of labor. Of course, you, you, you definitely admit that it's a, it's a relevant institution. You back calls to have the current you know, leadership of the NLC asked because by dint of their working, the blueprint for the institution has now become irrelevant. The, the appointing authority is there. The appointing authority should be observing what is happening and seeing what is happening on the ground on the labor front. Well, Dr. Nkumba insists that they only return to the classroom if their concerns are addressed. Well, the conditions we had given prior to end of December was that if government is unable to implement the uh, labor market survey of 2019, they should uh, restore us at least to the 2013 level of 114% of base pay as interim market premium. And that would be an interim measure that should take us until such time that they are able to complete their labor market survey and its processes and uh, implement a market premium. You, you don't care? We do care. But we've come to the end of the road. <laughs> There's nowhere else to go. Or we are not coming back because we have worked with assurances that have not worked for us and we are no longer taking assurances but except some concrete uh, indication or evidence that indeed our conditions of service are improved but the national labor commission rejects this position of utag in a statement the commission accuses utag of breaching the law by uh, failing to notify them of their action and will bring you details of that statement it says that uh, we refer to a news item on mynjoyonline.com and a letter from the fair wages and salaries commission both dated the 10th of january 2022 indicating that members of the university teachers association of ghana utag have instituted a strike action effective the 10th of january 2022 over an alleged quote delay by the fair wages and salaries commission to release the report of the labor market survey. Now it goes on to say that UTAC should have complied with section 159 of the Act, uh, Act 651, where the commission will be served the required notice to enable it to intervene immediately. This notwithstanding, the powers under section 139 of Act 1651, we write to invite the disputing parties to appear before the National Labor Commission on Wednesday, the 12th of January, 2022, at 2.30 p.m. for a hearing of the issue in dispute. The parties are urged to take note of the time and date and appear as scheduled. In view of the COVID-19 protocols, the representation by each side is restricted to a maximum of two persons, and this must also be noted. And this is signed by uh, Bernice Welbeck, who is the Director, Administration, HR, for the Executive Secretary of the National Labor Commission. 
And still on this, the Fair Wages and Salaries Commission says it will be engaging with UTAN. Elan Kra is the public relations officer. Department will do regarding the way forward, mm -hmm. but then ideally, normally, this is the trend. When a, a party goes on strike, Labour Commission, the National Labour Commission, which is empowered with a mandate to deal with industrial issues of, of this nature, they will invite both parties to the National Labour Commission, and then they will listen to both parties, and they will say the party on the strike should call off the strike because it's against the law. The, the, the leadership of, of UTAG is very much aware of this. It is after they have called off the strike that we will engage with them and look into the issue. Uh, if they are still not satisfied, there are processes and procedures they have to follow. Indeed, at the beginning of negotiations, we signed uh, uh, some rules of engagement. Those rules of engagement state that when you have a grievance, when the negotiation is not going the way in which you want it to go, there are processes you have to follow. You have to go to the Labour Commission, mm -hmm. go through arbitration or mediation and uh, certain, certain levels, and then we will come to a conclusion. Strike is the very, very last resort, but we have not uh, exhausted, uh, UTAC has not exhausted all those processes. So, um, as I said, I can't, I can't say what the government's position will be at the moment because we are yet to meet to decide on that. But the usual process is it will end up at the Labour Commission, and the Labour Commission will ask them to call up the strike and we'll get back to the table. All right, so Mr. Ankara, thank you so much for your time. To other stories, the management of the Confanochi Teaching Hospital has been defending its decision to sack an accounts officer who dragged the hospital to charge over alleged misapplication of COVID-19 funds and abuse of office. The hospital says it dismissed Awuni Acherba for breaching its grievance protocol and peddling falsehood against management in a case yet to be heard by the Commission for Human Rights and Administrative Justice. Speaking to Lab News, Public Relations Officer for Kath, Kwesi Kwame Frimpon, said it has not received any communication from Sharj and refused to acknowledge the existence of any petition before the Commission. into this case started long before the matter was sent to Sharj. He had made allegations prior to going to Sharj. And so the police was, were already on as we speak. We've not been notified or invited or written to by Shraj, either formally or informally. So as far as the board is concerned, it is unaware of any petition pending before Shraj. We have internal grievance resolution mechanisms or channels. When we are staff, when you have issues, for instance, with your head, or if you're in charge, you write to your head. When you have issues with your head, you write to the line director, or you approach the line director. When you have issues with your line director, you are put the chief executive. When you have issues with the chief executive, you are put to the board. And when you have issues with the board, you go to the Ministry of Health. That is the procedure. We have a disciplinary code that is clearly disseminated, widely disseminated in this hospital, that we are all subjected to. In other petitioner, Wuni Achiraba, has described his dismissal as a travesty of justice, saying he has not been given a fair hearing. A matter has arisen, and we've taken the matter to charge an independent body, arbiter, to decide. Then you say you have established. How did you establish that? How did the hospital, how did the board establish that? What record of proceedings was presented to the board chairman? Nana I think that the, the, this is a travesty of justice, what the hospital has done, a complete travesty of justice. Are you going to uh, see? Uh, oh, sure, I am contemplating, mm. probably, uh, very soon. And that's our show for tonight. Many thanks for your company. Please log on to myjoyonline.com. you find more stories there. I'm Ernest Mino.